apologies for then again for that going on but hopefully we're over all of the gremlins and we're going to get started so um what you probably don't know about me is in a previous life i was a technical staff training officer for guide dogs so i was teaching everyone else about how to present skills and even before then as a teenager and as a young child i was really into the arts so i did a lot of drama i did a lot of stage work and i really kind of think that's helped me to perfect my skills for when i speak in front of people so even now having had 20 minutes of a glitch i'm able to come on still be a bit cool and collected still kind of keep my nerve and keep going and a lot of that is through just practice and just knowing what's going on and being able to just just ride through those problems as it were so what we're going to do today i'm going to take you through some of these categories we're going to look at how to prepare we're going to look at introductions and expectations briefly going to have a little kind of uh, a quest into questioning skills and also how to deal with tricky customers what about if you have to adapt as well? What if your audience needs something different from you? And also how to close an event. It may seem really strange, but the worst thing is not knowing that the event is finished. Um, so being able to bring everything to a close is really important. But what I really wanna do is just give you a little bit more confidence in presenting, whether that's a workshop, whether that's a talk, whether that's your class whether it's just even speaking to one-to-one -one clients. Hopefully you'll gain a little bit of confidence from this. So firstly, know your material. I always like to know about 100% more that I'm likely to need to know for something that I'm presenting. I research it, I get in depth, I get in bed with it, I know as much about it as I can. Of course, we can never know everything about dogs, but we can make sure that when we present that we've been, have come across as being very confident, that we know our material, and that we can handle those left field questions that might come at us. It's quite important as well that you, um, I'm not saying don't have notes, but when you do have the notes, try not to read from them. When you look down, you look a little bit shy, your voice doesn't carry so far. What I find if I do have notes, and what I tend to do is have enough information on my PowerPoint presentations that it prompts my memory. But if I did want to have notes, I'd probably have something like a mind map. Uh, and if you haven't seen them, have a look at them. They're just little colorful bubbles that just help to remind us what we want to say. It gives us our key notes, our key points that we can bring out. When you're working about and looking at your screen, maybe, or your notes, make sure you elaborate. Don't just read it out. So instead of me saying elaborate, and then I've gone into it, I've just put it into a sentence. I've made sure that when I've said that to you, that it doesn't look like I'm reading from the screen. It's quite important that we admit if we don't know something as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. There's nothing worse than being found out as a liar. So if you don't know something, just admit it. We're not you know all fonts of all knowledge we do need um sometimes just to go check and that is absolutely fine if somebody knows something that you don't know thank them for that i love it when i do presentations and give talks and i learn something new be gracious about it as well you really don't want to um think about what you're you're doing you, you don't want to look ungracious about what you have, have said um and i think it really helps the audience engage with you and makes them feel really good and important about themselves as well so and again just go back to that old one just don't lie about anything if you don't know it you aren't something that you aren't you don't want to present something and say i'm such and such when you're not be really truthful and people will really see your being how genuine your being so let's talk about ticks what we mean by this is habits i had a habit when i first started presenting a lot i was presenting one day to a group of um, students at guide dogs and suddenly someone in the audience shouted at me and said tony can you put that pen down and i was like what and they went you're clicking a pen I had a ballpoint pen in my hand and I was clicking the top of it. And I didn't even know I was doing it. 
So I put the pen down and I carried on my presentation. Five minutes later, I looked down and the pen's back in my hands. And I'm like, oh, this is a big problem. So I had to train myself. I put all of the pens in a bag. I put that bag under a table and I made myself break that annoying habit. Because it's really distracting for your audience if you have something that you do that kind of just detracts from what you're saying or what you're showing. It's the same with speech patterns. If we always say something a familiar way, if we have a phrase that we always have at the beginning of a sentence, again, it can just become a little bit repetitive and a little bit annoying for people. I had to break myself of saying so at the beginning of sentences when I was running workshops. It became a thing that I really thought, mm, that I need to break this, I need to change this up a little bit. We all have the uh, habit of maybe speaking a little bit too fast when we are um, you know, nervous, um, we might move around quite a lot. I was watching a comedian recently and I was trying to work out why I wasn't really engaging with the comedy. And I realized it because the comedian was walking back and forward, back and forward across the stage really quickly, so quickly that I felt a little bit nauseous actually. So, you know, think about what you're doing with your hands, the speech pattern, any habits you might have, any phrases that you might overuse when you're presenting. And practice. Both me and my husband present quite a lot. And at various times, you'll find us squirreled away in a room somewhere talking to ourselves. This is not the first time I've given this presentation. I've practiced it. I know how long it takes. I know if there's any flaws in it that I can go back and change if I need to. I've made sure I'm aware of all of the bits that might trip me up. So I've made sure that it's as, as perfect as it can be as I'm going through. And I can change it as we go along as well, depending on whether I find that one bit doesn't work or I've repeated myself or maybe I've missed something out as well. So practice, video yourself so you can watch yourself as well. That's also really handy. <clears throat> Let's talk about how you present yourself. So what do you wear? I like to dress up a little bit when I give a webinar. I like to be able to feel good about myself. I like to make sure that my hair's done, that I've got a little bit extra makeup on than I possibly might normally wear. It makes me feel more confident and it also gives everybody a good impression of me. If I was doing a practical workshop, I would obviously wear suitable clothes, but I'd make sure again that they're smart and suitable. If I have a uniform, I'd wear a uniform. When I'm presenting myself, again, I'm thinking about, do I walk? Do I stand still? Because again, if i am got a presentation up on the screen and I'm walking in front of it, I'm gonna be blocking people's view or I'm gonna be walking in front of the projector. And also even just shifting a little bit left or right, you might notice that people start leaning to look around you because they can't see where you are. So think about where you stand in relation to where your presentation is, where the focus of people are going to be if they need to look at something that isn't just you. If you're in a class, for example, or you've got people in a horseshoe, you know, where you walk is going to really influence how people can see you, and whether they have to crane, crane their necks, for example. What you do with your hands is quite important. I've got a habit, I use my hands quite a lot, but I'm really aware of not waving them around too much because if I do again it can be a bit distracting. I try and smile when I'm presenting and I especially smile if someone's asking me a question and I'll nod as if I'm listening to them because of course I am. I'm acknowledging them but it when we're concentrating quite often we can look quite stern and it's not that we are stern and we're not unapproachable we're not frightening it's just it's our concentration face so if we smile we make ourselves smile it really helps our voice is really important can people hear us if we've got a big room do we need a microphone do we need some amplification if i'm speaking to a hall of people the first thing i will always check is can people hear me at the back so i always start off if you can hear me at the back give me a wave if nobody waves i know they can't hear me I, of course, am a bit used to presenting and projecting my voice, having done a lot of stage work. But if you haven't, maybe think about practicing about how you can not shout, 
but project your voice well enough that people can hear you. And if you're worried about it, think about that ampli amplification. Making eye contact with the audience, that might seem like a really simple thing, but we can get in the habit of just staring at one part of the room and that can exclude lots of other people. So when I'm presenting, I look up this way, I look at that person, I make eye contact here, I look at the back of the room, I look at the front of the room. I'm constantly just changing my eye position and I'm holding people's gazes as well. So they really feel like I'm looking at them, I'm engaged with them, that I'm listening to them. It also means I can check the mood of the room. Is anyone fidgeting? Is anyone a bit hot? Does anyone look like they need a break? You may have to do some things to make you feel confident in, to, in the beginning. And um, there's lots of things we can do. Power poses are good. So we can stand very tall, put our shoulders back, have a very open body language. It may be that beforehand we do some breathing exercises to help settle our nerves. I know with, you know, T-touch, you might want to do a heart hug on yourself, which will make you feel a little bit um, more settled in yourself as well. It could be that it's the shoes you wear. It could be the clothes you wear. Whatever it is that makes you feel more confident. It could be that you've practiced. Think about those one or two things that are going to help you to feel better about yourself. I often think to myself, well, actually, I probably know more than most of the people in the room. So that gives me a little bit of confidence if I'm presenting something that I know people don't know about. And again, that goes back to my preparation and making sure that I know my material. So let's talk about the setup in the room. There's nothing worse than going to a talk or a seminar and just something about the room just doesn't work for the audience. So we need to think about the sun, for, for example. If you've got windows in the room and you've got a PowerPoint on, can that, at some point when the sun moves around, start to block out the sight of the screen? Or will it be shining in people's eyes? If you notice the sun's coming in and you can just go and close a, a curtain, you can do that in the middle of your talk. People will really appreciate that. I once did a talk at a very well-known rescue organization and uh, their training room had a full glass window. And they'd already set the room up when I arrived. And they'd set it up so that the screen was facing this glass window. I knew that the sun was gonna go down and it was gonna come straight in and shine in everybody's face. So we, tried, we couldn't have time, we didn't have time to change the room. So we tried to block out as much as we could with um, taping things to the window. But at some point in my talk, I actually stopped and I said, look, I can see you people are really struggling. Would you like to move? Because the sun's in your eyes, I can see that it's uncomfortable for you. So check that out and remember the sun moves. Think about temperature, there's nothing worse than being too cold or too hot when you're trying to learn something. Check it out and recheck it through the day as well because heating will go up and down depending on the sun, depending on heating going on and off, how many people you've got in the room, for example. You might have external uh, disturbances. You know, there may be noisy cars or people outside. There may be a noisy fan on that you might have to turn off. So be aware of everything that's around you and everything that happens. And don't be afraid to just stop, give people a break and sort those problems out. Your equipment, know your equipment. That's a bit of a laugh today because obviously mine didn't work very well today. However, um, when you are going, if you've got things like screens, if you've got things like projectors, make sure you've got spares. Have you got a spare bulb? Do you have spare um, batteries for your, if you have a screen changer? Anything you might have that might go wrong, try and really be aware and be very, um, know how your equipment works. I was, uh, the last time I do, did a presentation, I was doing it with a new laptop. So I set up my PowerPoint projector beforehand at home just to check that it connected, that it worked. And I suddenly found out that the cable I had didn't have anywhere to plug in on my laptop anymore. So rushed upstairs to my husband, who's got a bag of lovely bits of equipment and cables, went, I need this, and he found me the right cable. Now, if I hadn't checked until I'd got to the venue, I wouldn't have been able to project my PowerPoint onto the screen from my laptop. So check it, make sure you know how it works. Acoustics can really, really 
mark you up. Um, if any of you have been to the Kennel Club building up at Stoneley, you'll know the main hall, the acoustics are awful. I once had to give a presentation in that um, hall and I was actually second on. And there was dog training things happening at one end and then there was a little area set up for talks. And the first talk was something really fascinating. I couldn't hear half of it. Half of it just doesn't, the acoustics were just so bad. So when I, it was my turn, I decided I was going to move everyone to a specific place in the room that was closer to me and that I only had to look in one direction. And I made sure they were close enough and I said, look, I need to really amplify my voice. Can you tell me if you can't hear me? Because I know that we really struggled in the last one. So check those acoustics out. You can't always do something about it, but you could bring your audience closer or you could do something to yourself that maybe would make it easier for them. When we're looking at seating, what do you want? Do you want people in the round? Do you want people behind tables? Do you want people in a theatre style? Think about where you're going to stand, what side of your screen you're standing if you're presenting again on a screen. And when you are setting up, get a helper to sit in the very corners, especially on your side, just to check that they can see past you. Because it may be that you're standing in the way, and again, you'll get people doing this, <laughs> and they won't be able to see around you, which is really, really difficult for people. So, you know, there's lots of ways of setting out. Also, if you think about if you're in a circle, the people either side of you are going to struggle to see. So you might decide to have it in a horseshoe instead with you in the, the centre point, the open bit of the you, the horseshoe part. Health and safety is really important. Where are your cables? Can you take them down? Can you put something over them, which means people don't fall over them? Can you do warn people as well say oh if you want to come up and talk to me that's fine just be aware the cables are here don't step over this chair or don't trip over these cables be aware of that, that health and safety make sure you point out exits for fires and all of that stuff as well where do you place your merchandise if you have any i'm quite particular about it i like people it to be in the main room so people can see it and they will go and and browse through it through the day but i don't like it being right next to where the um refreshments are coming out because nine times out of ten somebody will put a cup on the table it'll get knocked over and half your stock will get ruined so i am quite particular i do say to people please don't put drinks on the table because i've lost so much equipment that way but have it somewhere in view you don't really want it in another room because people might not see it they might not wander through they won't do that kind of browsing thing you know when you get to the checkout of the supermarket you know sometimes you pick up an item just because it's there and it looks pretty and you kind of you know you get sucked into that buying mode so let's talk about when people arrive Let's talk about setting up the atmosphere because this is quite important. Even if I have someone booking people in and checking them off as they the register as they come in, I like to stand at the table and just welcome people. So, Hi, how are you? It's really lovely to meet you. I'm Tony. Um, I'm presenting today. Don't assume people know who you are. Wear your name badge if you have one or even a sticker. The amount of times that you know people have called me Tina or Terry or something like that. So I, I don't want to assume that everyone knows who I am. And it may just be they think, oh, it's a very friendly person who's just said hello, but they might not necessarily know you're presenting the day. So smile, introduce yourself. Check that they know what they're allowed to do, where they're allowed to go, where the facilities are. Can they get a drink now? Can they get their dogs in now if it's a dog event? If they have a dog and they're struggling with loads of bags, offer to help. Or if their dog isn't settled, offer to get them a coffee. Do something that makes them feel at home. That's going to really help them just engage with you, to trust you, to make them feel welcome and relaxed. Because when we go to things as dog people, we often go on our own. And that can be really daunting as well. So making sure that we are happy, relaxed, settled can be really good. So let's talk about our introduction. When you first start, Welcome people again. Hi, tell them the subject. Tell them about yourself. You might use an icebreaker. I tend to use a bit of a joke. I normally say, oh, I've been doing this work for such and such many years and I started very young, blah, blah, blah. Something that might make them laugh just to settle you into the, the, the day and to help them just to relax as well. 
let them know how long the sessions are and when the breaks are going to be because some people get a bit twitchy if they need to have a drink or they need to spend their dog or they have a phone call to make so when the breaks happen is really quite important and I always say to people, look, if you need to go to the toilet, don't wait. Don't put your hand up and ask, just go. I'm not going to get worried if you get up and leave the room. It might be that they really need to leave the room. Tell them if they're allowed to have their phones on or not. You know, some people need to check children at home or dogs at home. You might say to them, you can put your, your phone on to vibrate. If you need to take a call, do you mind just leaving the room? Just let them know what they can do so they don't feel silly if it does go off or embarrassed, for example. When do you want to take questions? Some people like to take questions just at the end. Uh, some people like to take questions as we're going along because it's more relevant. It might be that they don't understand something you've said. If they don't understand it, just reword it in a different way. But also if they haven't understood it, there may be other people in the room that don't who don't want to ask. So don't be frightened to just go over something in a different way that they might understand a little bit better. So if you want to take questions at the end, say that, but also say about what kind of questions you, you will take. We can sometimes get sucked into people's own problems with their own dogs. So I tend to say I'm happy to answer all questions relating to the subject that I'm talking about. If you want to talk to me about your own personal problems or your own personal dog, I'm happy to talk to you in the break, but we'll just stick to the subject for now. And that means other people don't feel alienated or bored. We don't get dragged into a subject for too long. You can set the tone, you can say it's humorous, you can be fun. I always like to say to people, I know you learn better if you are having a laugh. Um, I want you to be comfortable. If it means you need to kick your shoes off or put your feet up or sit on the ground, whatever you wanna do, be comfortable. If you're saying things that are confidential as well, you need to let people know that. You can say, okay, whatever's said in this room needs to stay in this room. Um, or if we're talking about things, you're not going to mention people's names. For example, if you're talking about clients um, or case studies that you've worked on, be careful about that confidentiality. You never know who knows somebody else who knows that person you might be talking about or that dog you might be talking about. Change names, change circumstances. Find out people's experience. It's no good talking to a group of people about something quite simple and breaking it down into simple steps if they're already experts to a certain level they're going to want to know that higher level stuff which comes into that adaptation that we were taught i was talking about that we'll look into a bit later so i always say who's a behaviorist who's a trainer who's a vet who's a vet nurse i like to know so it might be an individual group so you can pitch your information at a different level for those people who might know a little bit more Tell people if they've got handouts, because people sometimes like to take loads of notes and um, other people don't, but they like to take something home with them. Sometimes you get they get lost in taking notes and they don't listen to what you're saying. So if they know they've got those handouts, um, it's handy for them to, to either have them then, or if you don't want them flicking through them because they're not ones that you want to make notes on, say, I will give them to you at the end. When are you available? So there are people who are too shy to ask questions. And they want to talk to you about specific dogs and specific things that relate to them. When I'm presenting and teaching, I, I always make myself available for the pretty much the majority of the day. Some presenters like to take themselves off for lunch. I may take myself off for like 10 minutes, but I'll tell people I'll be back at a certain time if anyone wants to approach me and talk to me separately. And that just helps those shyer people just to be able to come and ask those questions and feel like you're approachable. Because um, if you disappear for all the breaks, again, you can seem a little bit cold, a little bit uncaring. If people have paid to have you and have your expertise for the day, I really think that you need to be available. That's my personal opinion. It's not everybody's, but just let people know. So where to stand, that makes a world of difference. We've talked about this a little bit before. You can move around the room if you're, say, for example, doing a workshop and you've got everyone in a circle. What I tend to do is I will change maybe where I sit or where I stand or where I demonstrate so that different people have a different view. People learn differently from where they sit in the room as well. So you'll find 
you probably know yourself, if you go to a room, you always like to sit in a particular area um, or a particular part of the circle. And it's because it helps your learning. But it also can sometimes block you seeing stuff. So make sure you move around um, appropriately and make sure everyone can still see you. And again, if you're using that screen, you can stand quite a lot to the side, but you may not want to change size unless maybe it's after a break and you might change it so people get a crick in the neck in a different direction. Humour. Humour is good, but it needs to be appropriate and it needs to be timely. It can, if you use it too much, seem like you're a bit flippant. So make sure that when you say it, it's used sparingly, it's used at the right time. Um, sometimes some people have you know, a bit of a black humour that might not seem appropriate. So if you know that your humour sometimes is a little bit cutting edge, maybe just write some, some jokes down, make sure that you stick to the appropriate kind. But it can really lighten the mood. It can really help break the ice. It's good sometimes if you see people starting to flag, starting to fall asleep. I used to do a lot of talks to um, the WI, the Women's Institute. Quite often old ladies will fall asleep. So if you can just brighten up what you're saying, change how you speak, throw in a joke, you can just wake up everybody up a little bit. It's okay to take the mick out yourself, but please don't take the mick out of anybody else because that can really hurt people's feelings, really kind of make them feel a bit small. It's not a very appropriate thing to do. So I try never to take the mick out of other people, but I do quite often just kind of make a joke about my own self. Let's talk about questions. We need to talk about open questions. Now, there's a way of remembering what an open question is, and it's bums on goalposts. And that's what this picture is all about. So it's questions that get answers that aren't yes and no. So avoid the closed questions. So if I said something like, um, is that black or white? That isn't more of an open question because they might say white, but it's not really going to get you much information. But if you said something like, what colour is this? Then they, people can describe it. So think about where, what, why, when, how and who. Those are going to get more information out of people. You can then also use probing questions. So, oh, that's really interesting. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Or you, or you change the question slightly. You ask them a different question so it draws more information out. So avoid that ones that are going to be a yes or a no answer because that's really not going to get you anywhere. Don't make people feel stupid. If they say you ask a question of the audience and somebody answers, and it's not quite the right answer, maybe ask them again in a different way. Maybe help them out a little bit. Maybe go, oh yeah, that's really interesting. Has anyone else got a view on that? Does anyone else want to answer that question? Because if you go, oh no, that's not right. Again, it's gonna make people feel small, people feel insignificant. They're not gonna go away feeling very good about themselves. So help them out, you know, change what you say. Say to them, yeah, I can kind of see where you're coming from. Yeah, that's kind of half right. Maybe, you know, you, you can then answer or change what they've said so it becomes out a little bit more correct. What if you don't know the answer? Again, tell them you don't know the answer. That's really interesting. I don't know the answer to that one. Hmm. Let me have a think. You could take a sip of water. That might help. You can have a little thinking time. You could go, oh, does anyone else in the audience have a, um, an answer to that one or have an opinion about that? Throw it out. Somebody will know the answer. And if nobody does, knows the answer, Tell them, do you know what? I'm going to go and find that answer out for you. However, you know, I'll, I'll get back to you. And if you say that, make sure you do. So it could be that you email them after the presentation. It could be you find out at lunchtime by phoning your friend and finding out what to say. But make sure you do get back to them if you say you are. Also acknowledge everyone in the room. So when there are a question and answer session, it could be that three or four people put their hand up at once and you answer somebody's question and then somebody else's. Remember where the other people are and make sure you go back to them or make sure at the end you go, did I answer everybody's questions? And look around the room and make eye contact again. Because if you really want to ask a question that the presenter's forgotten about you, uh, you know, again, it doesn't make you feel that great. 
So acknowledge everybody, make sure. And if you don't have time to answer everybody because you need to wrap it up because people need to go home, just say, oh, I know I need to answer your question. Come and find me afterwards and I'll answer that for you. We can talk about it together. Sometimes if someone asks me a really good question in the break, I'll go, re-ask me that when we get back in the, in the group. Because there'll be other people that will really benefit from that information. Audience management. Yes, sometimes this can be a little bit tricky. Most of the time, people are pretty forgiving, they're pretty nice, but you do sometimes get the argumentative person, the person who doesn't agree with you, and it's about how to shut those people down professionally, really, to close that conversation in a way that doesn't end up in a slanging match, you know, an altercation in front of everybody else. So sometimes I will, you know, listen to their point of view and I might say, well, that, that's an interesting point of view. I can see where you're coming from. It's not really my point of view. I can, you know, you can maybe just bring it round to saying, well, I kind of let's agree to disagree about that. Or you may just sort of just smile and say, you know, the, everyone's allowed to have their opinion. You know, I'm, I'm happy for you to have opinion. It's not my opinion. But, you know, that's great. If you really strongly agree with that and that's how you feel, then that's great. Um, if you've got someone who's just being a bit noisy and a bit annoying and really kind of, you know, disrupting the group, sometimes body blocking can help. So that may be that you don't look at them for a while, that you almost turn sideways onto them. I once gave a, uh, a lecture to a group of very young students at an, at an agricultural college. And half of the room were jumping up and shouting and mucking about and pretending to be sick and doing all these really horrible things. And half the room were really trying to listen. So I went and stood right next to the person who was being the most annoying. And I just kind of hovered behind them. And I just talked to the half of the room that really wanted to listen to me. And that person just calmed down, started to feel a bit quieter, settled. Everyone who I wasn't looking at started to go, well, you're not looking at me, you're not looking at me, I want to hear you as well. So it just managed to kind of just settle that kind of busyness down. It's very unlikely you'll get that. Um, but occasionally just moving and standing by that person can really help. You might have to take a break and just say, oh, look, can I just ask you just to kind of give me a helping hand here? Can you kind of just, you know, understand that we're kind of moving on from that conversation now it could also be that you need to move on time hoggers time hoggers are those people who just keep asking questions about their own dog or keep just kind of interrupting that nobody else can ask questions and you're going off down a channel that you really don't want to go down when that happens i often say to people you know it's be great i'd love to talk to you about that Time's getting on. Can we talk about that in the break? Come and find me and we'll, we'll finish that discussion then. Notice people's body language. Are they starting to flag? Are they uh, shuffling in their seats? Are they yawning? Do they look like they need to get up and move? Is it time to put an activity in? Is it time to have a little mini break? You know, is that just a, let's just have a two minute comfort break and then you'll find people will shoot off to the loo or grab a quick drink and then they'll, they'll bring it back and then that's fine. They've woken themselves up a bit. Or do you put another exercise in at that point, which just helps the room just come back up again? So think about things of how you can manage, notice the little things that might be going wrong as well. Adaptation. There'll be times when the information you give, the depth of it needs to change. Either the audience isn't getting it because they don't know enough and you're pitching it too high or, they're, or you're pitching it too low. And this goes back to knowing your subject and knowing more than you need to know so that you can change that information level for them. And like I say, you know, if you're doing group work and you know you've got a group of behaviorists and a group of trainers and you all might have to have different levels of, of, of information, maybe group them in a way that means you can give that higher bit of information to the people who need it. You can also change your, your speech patterns if people aren't getting what you're saying. People learn either by hearing, by doing, by feeling, by seeing. If you say to somebody, do you see what I mean? And they don't get it. Maybe just changing your language slightly by saying, does that ring a bell? 
suddenly they go, oh, yeah, yeah, it does. So because we all learn differently, we speak differently. And if somebody's on a different wavelength to you because they learn differently, if we swap how we are talking to them, that can really help sometimes. Length of sessions are important. I don't like to go over really an hour. People then start to get a bit twitchy. They need a break. Um, if you've got a really long presentation, put a break in the middle. You know, make sure that people get that chance to get up, even if it's just five, 10 minutes to go to the toilet, grab a drink. But just make sure that there's the session lens will match people's learning. People after 20 minutes can't really concentrate very much anyway. Watch the energy levels in the room. Make sure that people, you pick them up. Make sure that you make yourself more animated, change your voice pattern, get them excited again, maybe move around a bit more, um, do anything, get them to stand up and turn around, pat themselves on the back, do something that just brings that energy back up again if you can see everyone's just starting to dip a little bit. And what about your expectations? You might have an expectation that people come and they may have done some homework or they may have brought things with them or they've prepared and quite often, sometimes that's not the case. So you may have to lower your expectations of what you're going to get out of the day. How much can you get done? Does um, Do your learners need to have more time on one particular subject? Does the group exercises need to be longer or shorter? Do you need to change something about your expectations of what you're going to get out of the day and also what your learners are going to get out of the day? Upselling. So when to do it, how to do it, make sure you've got all the information. I always will say to people, I've got uh, lots of things for sale. Go and have a look, a browse. I'll be available in the breaks to come and um, to, to help you. Or I might, if I've got an assistant, get them to kind of stand by the table to take money and all of that stuff and answer questions. And I always say to people in the last break, just before we break for that last afternoon tea break, okay, um, the shop's still open. They will be open afterwards, but if you want to do any of your purchases, do them now. Just make sure everybody goes and, and does it then because at the end of the day, people just want to get home quite often. When you're doing that upselling, you know, don't push it too much. Don't be, be really, really selly, selly, but just say, look, there's stuff there for you or if you have got a course that you want to sell or an ebook or something that isn't in the room, have that information in a way that they can take it home with them because they might not write it down. Have it on a postcard or a book um, marker or um, a sheet of paper or a pamphlet that they can take away from them. Just make sure you've got all the information with you, that upselling thing. Drip feed it through the day. Just make sure you don't do it right at the end. You just said, right, seminar's finished. Oh, and by the way, there's stuff you can buy because everyone, you've lost them by then. Let's talk about timing. So think about the starting blocks. It's when we are doing a presentation, we want to start on time. If people are late arriving and they may have said, may have rung and said, oh, I'm stuck in traffic, blah, blah, blah. Give them a few minutes grace. But for all the people that have got there in time, if you're said to start at nine and you don't start till quarter past or half past, they're going to be like twitching and kind of looking at their watch. Well, why did I have to get here early? So if you say you're going to start at nine, say to people, OK, I've got a few people missing. I'm going to just give them two or three minutes to arrive. If not, we'll get started. Um, if we have a second day, I often say to people, right, I'll be here at nine with a kettle on, but we're starting promptly at 10.30. Can you make sure you're here? I always like to put a registration time in so that people can arrive, settle down, get teas, but tell them this is registration time, but we are starting at half nine. Otherwise, everyone just turns up at half nine and, and they're still grabbing drinks and settling themselves in. When you're doing group work, let them know the time. OK, we're going to have 15 minutes from this. And don't just say 15 minutes. Actually say the time because people will forget to look at their watches. So we're going to do 15 minutes. So at quarter two, we're going to meet back together. Give them a five minute warning as well, because they may have just if they've got two or three questions to answer there or two or three things to, tasks to do, they might but still be on the first one. So just keep giving them that five minute break. Of, oh, we're going to gather in a few more minutes. Make sure you're back in the room by this time. But do stick to your timings as well. And I don't mean just for group work, I mean for the whole day. If you say, oh, we're going to have lunch at one, have lunch at one. 
If you say we're going to finish at a particular time, finish on that time. People have long journeys. People have children to go back to, dogs to go back to. If it runs over, you'll lose people's interest. Um, I once was um, at a course with you know, a, a fairly well-known um, presenter and they, uh, we were doing a, a five-day course and one day they overran by two hours. That's not acceptable. You know, that just eats into people's time and, and makes people anxious. Stick to your times. I sometimes negotiate times. So I always maybe a lot an hour for lunch, but I might say to people, we've, we've got an hour for lunch. Do you need an hour? Some people will go, oh, no, I only need 20 minutes. And I'll go, well, yeah, but some people have got dogs to walk and they need to eat. So should we settle on, say, 40 minutes? So negotiate, negotiate that time. Also, don't be pressurized into not having breaks because you will need a break. It's really tiring presenting. So when you are negotiating those times, factor in what you need as well. I have sometimes people say, oh, should we not have an afternoon break because they want to get away early? And I'll go, well, no, actually, we do need to because I need to break. Okay, doke, closing the show. When we close the show, we need to close the show. I used to have um, a colleague when I worked at the UK Wolf Conservation Trust who would present and quite often he'd go, and finally, and then he'd speak for another 15 minutes. And people were like, oh, that's a long finish. <laughs> and it was unclear. People didn't know when the end was coming. I always make a real point of going, okay, we are finished. You are allowed to go. I've made sure I give everybody all the information they need because if I say, right, it's all over, and then I go, oh, by the way, I need to do this, I need to give you a handout, I need to give you my address, my email address, people are already packing up, they don't hear you. Get all that information out and then go to them. Okay, we're finished. Have a good day. It's been lovely to see you. Um, and, and you can go home now. If you know them quite well, you can be quite cheeky and go, right, off you pop, we're all done for the day. Or you can be a bit more formal and go, really enjoyed presenting for you today and I um, have safe journeys home and I'll see you tomorrow or I'll see you again soon. Uh, um, you know, make sure it's finished. So to try and emulate that, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, Leanne will hand back, we'll hand back to her.